Chapter 5 of Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln, A History, Volume 7, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter 5. Preludes to the Vicksburg Campaigns. The promotion of General Halleck to the chief command of the armies of the United States, and his removal to Washington, placed General Grant at the head of the armies of the West. He was not, at first, able to follow his natural disposition, and to attack the enemy opposed to him, on account of the large subtractions which were made from his forces to enable Buell to hold his positions in Tennessee. He had a long line to hold, from Memphis to Corinth, and had all he could do to guard it against the attacks of an active and vigilant enemy. He massed his troops, as well as he could, in a triangle of which the points were Jackson, Bolivar, and Corinth. He remained about two months in this enforced inactivity, which was only broken at last by an attack of the enemy. The Confederate generals Price and Van Dorn were in front of him, the former on the left and the latter on the right, and towards the middle of September they made a movement, the object of which was to effect a junction, and either attack and disperse the forces of Grant, or, together passing his flank, to reinforce Bragg in his campaign against Buell. In pursuance of this object, Price seized the village of Iuka, twenty-one miles southeast of Corinth, Colonel Robert C. Murphy, who commanded the place, giving way without resistance, and displaying a pusillanimity which, when repeated on a subsequent occasion, caused great damage to the Union arms. As soon as Grant heard of the movement, he prepared, with his usual energy, to prevent the two Confederate generals from effecting their junction. He ordered General Rosencrans, whose troops were at the moment south of Corinth, to attack Iuka on the southwest, and General E. O. C. Ord to march on the north of the Memphis and Charleston Railroad and attack that side of the town at the same moment. The two generals had about 17,000 men, almost equally divided. This plan met with the usual ill success which attended such concerted movements during the early part of the war. Rosencrans was himself attacked by the Confederates two miles south of Iuka, and the head of his column was roughly handled. The engagement lasted several hours, but, as a strong wind was blowing from the north, Ord, who was only a few miles away, and who was waiting for the signal of Rosencrantz's attack, heard not a shot nor a sound. He got the news, however, during the night, and pushed on to Iuka in the morning, only to find that the town was deserted, and that the enemy, after holding Rosencrantz in check during the afternoon on the Jacinto Road, had escaped during the night by the Fulton Road, a few miles further east. Price passed in this way round the right flank and rear of Rosencrans and joined Van Dorn at Ripley. Both sides claimed the advantage in this affair. Rosencrans's loss was 790, and Price's was 535. Price and Van Dorn came together in the latter part of September, and before the 1st of October, Grant ascertained that another movement was in progress against him. This time, Corinth was the point of attack. Rosencrantz occupied that place with some 23,000 men. Ord at Bolivar had 12,000, and there was a small reserve at Jackson, where Grant had established his headquarters. Van Dorn, being the ranking officer, took command of the Confederate forces amounting to some 22,000. He reached Pocahontas, a point about 20 miles northwest of Corinth, on the 1st of October, and pushed for that place with great force and celerity. His object, as set forth by himself in his report, was to attack the forces there, drive them back on the Tennessee, and cut them off, then turn upon Bolivar and Jackson, overrun West Tennessee, and effect a communication with General Bragg through Middle Tennessee. The campaign was well planned, and if it could have been successfully carried out, would have been a very great advantage to the Confederates. The attack upon Corinth began under the most favorable auspices. Rosencrantz's forces were attacked near the outlying works at some distance from the town, and forced back into the inner entrenchments with considerable loss. 
the confederates bivouacked for the night within a few hundred yards of the union forces and expected an easy day's work on the morrow van dorn ordered general louis hebert to attack vigorously on the left at daylight swinging his left wing along the ohio railroad against the north side of the town dabney h maury commanding the centre was to move directly from the west and mansfield lovell was to second the attack from the southwest but the whole plan miscarried hebert instead of attacking at daybreak came to headquarters at seven o'clock and said he was too sick to fight it was two hours later before his command under the next in rank general martin e green attacked and maury having already become engaged the assault lacked the unity and vehemence required the confederates nevertheless fought with great bravery and determination and were opposed with equal gallantry by the national troops in the town they succeeded in breaking the union line and entering the streets of corinth but the attacking party being subjected to a terrible cross-fire of artillery were driven out again with heavy loss the battle lasted only a short while and before lovell had begun to bring his forces seriously into action from the southwest the other divisions had been repulsed and he could do nothing more than cover the retreat the confederate loss was very severe rosencrans reported their killed at one thousand four hundred twenty three and he captured two thousand two hundred sixty eight prisoners their total loss as indicated by the records was four thousand eight hundred thirty eight as the union soldiers fought behind breastworks they suffered much less their loss being only two thousand five hundred twenty the troops rested from noon of the fourth to the morning of the fifth and then started after the retreating enemy general rosencrans took the wrong road and lost eight miles by his mistake van dorn in his retreat fell in with ord's detachment by whom he was sharply attacked and driven away from davis's bridge and compelled to cross further south ord being seriously wounded in this fight the pursuit from his column ceased rosencrans came up with van dorn too late to prevent his crossing the hatchie and on reporting this to general grant he concluded that the chase was no longer of any use and ordered rosencrans to return although in neither of these engagements had general rosencrans in the opinion of general grant gained all the advantages he should have done from the defeat of the enemy they were not without their importance in defeating the junction of van dorn's army with bragg and for some time afterwards west tennessee was safe from any incursions from the south general rosencrans himself received ungrudging praise from the country and from the government he was promoted to the grade of major general and given command of the army of the cumberland and although general grant did not suggest and would not have approved this promotion he took a certain grim satisfaction in it as it relieved him from the command of a subordinate who had not fulfilled his expectations van dorn who had planned his campaign with good judgment made his attack with energy and when it failed effected his retreat with great skill and success was blamed severely for his failure though a court of inquiry exonerated him from all censure jefferson davis although van dorn had lost nothing in his estimation by the untoward result of the attack on corinth still felt that it would not be advisable to continue him in chief command of the troops in that region and therefore made j c pemberton a lieutenant-general and ordered him to mississippi he assumed command at jackson on the fourteenth of october eighteen sixty two towards the end of that month general grant in view of the repulse of the enemy in his front and the good condition of his troops under his command reinforced by the new levies of the summer began to turn his thoughts in the direction of an advance through the state of mississippi in rear of vicksburg he suggested in a letter to general halleck on the twenty sixth of october the destruction of all the railroads about corinth and an advance southward from grand junction along the east bank of the yazoo river and in pursuance of that idea he gathered in from bolivar and corinth a force of about thirty thousand men who arrived in the neighborhood of grand junction on the fourth of november general halleck on being informed of this movement telegraphed his approval of it 
and added also that he had ordered the troops at helena in arkansas to cross the river and threaten granada on the mississippi central railroad halfway between grand junction and vicksburg it was therefore under the best possible auspices that grant began his movement southward he had an excellent army well composed and well officered inured to camp life and with the habit of victory he was heartily and generously supported and seconded at washington he enjoyed the confidence of the president and the enthusiastic support of the country the prize before him was also of a nature to excite to the highest point of activity the ambition and the energies of any general the position of the mississippi river was indispensable to the success of the national cause so long as this vast highway was closed at any point to the fleets of the union the national power was to a great extent paralyzed in the west the triumphant campaign of donelson and henry and its resulting operations had freed the river from its source to the city of vicksburg the gallantry of farragut and his fleet in the memorable passage of forts jackson and st philip and the subsequent capture of new orleans had given to the union the control of the mouths of the great river but from vicksburg to port hudson a distance by the river of some two hundred miles the enemy held almost unbroken possession and by means of this great belt of territory they kept up undisturbed communication with the country west of the river they held louisiana as a field of maneuver and supply the vast empire of texas the most important beef-producing region of the continent was subject to their orders in short the louisiana purchase was virtually their own and their only communication by land with the outside world was through their southwestern frontier the post of vicksburg owed its importance primarily to its topographical situation the mississippi river runs from memphis to vicksburg a stretch of two hundred miles as the crow flies and twice that distance if we follow the sinuosities of the stream through a flat and rich alluvial country of dreary monotony and dullness on the eastern side of the river between the two points we have mentioned stretches a vast low valley sixty miles in width at its broadest part bounded by the river on the west and on the east by a long range of hills which in former ages was the eastern limit of the bed of a prodigious watercourse along the foot of these hills runs the yazoo river and the whole country is intersected in every direction by swamps bayous and sluggish streams creeping through the vast forests of cyprus the bluffs we have mentioned leave the mississippi river at memphis and curving to the east do not join the river again until they reach vicksburg from there to port hudson they follow the eastern bank of the river and turn sharply to the east between that point and new orleans we have detailed in another place the unsuccessful attempts of farragut and williams to capture vicksburg in april and june of eighteen sixty two these failures so raised the spirits of the rebel officers there that general van dorn who was in command of the confederate troops after general williams had returned to baton rouge determined to take the offensive and attack him there he sent general breckinridge with two divisions against that position the last of july a severe action took place in which the confederates were repulsed with great loss their ram arkansas was set on fire after having run aground on the union side the loss was comparatively slight although it included the brave and accomplished general williams but though the confederate attack had failed of its immediate object the capture of baton rouge general breckinridge notwithstanding his defeat acted with admirable judgment in seizing the commanding point of port hudson immediately above baton rouge and strongly fortifying it the union troops not being reinforced soon afterwards returned to new orleans and for nearly a year more the rebel garrisons at port hudson and vicksburg dominated a stretch of two hundred miles of the mississippi river just as general grant was proposing to start on his expedition southward he received a dispatch from halleck promising him large reinforcements in a short time the prospect of this addition to his force induced him to delay his principal movement for a few days but he sent a large reconnoitering party under the command of general james b mcpherson 
towards holly springs from which he learned that there was a considerable force of the enemy in that neighborhood and having been informed by halleck that memphis would be made a depot of a general military and naval expedition to vicksburg he grew impatient at the prospect of continued delay and telegraphed to halleck asking whether he was to wait at grand junction until the memphis expedition was fitted out or whether he was to push south as far as possible he also asked whether w t sherman was to move subject to his orders or whether he was to be reserved for some special service to which halleck answered you have command of all troops sent to your department and have permission to fight the enemy where you please grant next asked for an addition to the railroad rolling stock then accumulated at memphis to which halleck answered that it was not advisable to undertake the repair of railroads south that grant's operations in mississippi should be limited to rapid marches upon any collected force of the enemy and he suggested a rapid turning movement down the river as soon as necessary forces could be collected on the fifteenth of november grant having determined to move forward sent for sherman and concerted with him a plan of operations grant was to move in person with the troops from grand junction sherman was to come out with an auxiliary force from memphis and join grant on the tallahatchie and curtis was to send a force over the river from arkansas to demonstrate upon the rear of the enemy at granada as the expedition was on the point of moving grant received a dispatch from halleck asking how many men could be spared for a movement down the river reserving merely enough to hold corinth and west tennessee grant replied that he could let sixteen thousand go from memphis to be taken mainly from the new levies there but that he required the rest of his force to move against pemberton halleck immediately answered approving the proposed movement but cautioning grant not to go too far the expedition started as arranged on the twenty sixth of november eighteen sixty two grant's cavalry crossed the tallahatchie on the first of december his infantry and sherman's forces following close after the troops from helena crossed as agreed under general alvin p hovey his cavalry came to within seven miles of granada and inflicted considerable damage on the railroads the confederate force fell back as grant advanced the union columns meeting only slight skirmishing parties of the enemy the pursuit continued as far as oxford and even there it was not the stand of the confederates but trouble in his logistics that brought grant's advance to a halt the embarrassment of feeding a large force by a single line of railway and that generally out of repair was far greater than he had counted upon the country was free along the line of the mississippi central as far as granada on the third of december but the difficulties of supply had already become so great that on the next day he asked halleck in a telegram sent from abbeville how far south would you like me to go with my present force it would not be safe to go beyond granada and attempt to hold present lines of communication the day after when his cavalry had arrived at coffeeville only eighteen miles from granada the obstacles to his advance had become so great that he proposed to halleck to send sherman with the helena and memphis troops south of the mouth of the yazoo river and thus secure vicksburg and the state of mississippi halleck at once directed him not to attempt to hold the country south of the tallahatchie but to collect twenty five thousand troops at memphis by the twentieth of the month for the vicksburg enterprise grant had asked do you want me to command the expedition on vicksburg or shall i send sherman he took halleck's dispatch of the preceding day you will move your troops as you may deem best to accomplish the great object in view as a sufficient answer to his question and immediately wrote general sherman will command the expedition down the mississippi he will have a force of about forty thousand men will land above vicksburg up the yazoo if practicable and cut the mississippi central railroad and the railroad running east from vicksburg where they cross the black river i will cooperate from here my movements depending on those of the enemy full and elaborate orders were issued to sherman in the sense of the above dispatch on the eighth of december and he hurried to memphis to organize and take charge of this important expedition which grant 
with his usual unselfishness had put in the hands of his most trusted subordinate he had no hesitation in thus giving to another the opportunity for this brilliant and conspicuous exploit while he reserved for himself the more modest task of holding the enemy's forces in check on the alabusha it was understood between the two generals in conversation that in case pemberton retreated grant would follow him up to the mississippi between the yazoo and the big black rivers having once resolved upon the expedition grant urged sherman to use all possible dispatch in getting away and such energy and zeal was put into the work that a week after sherman reached memphis on his return from oxford sixty-seven boats had arrived at memphis and the embarkation began on the morning of the nineteenth one reason for this haste on the part of grant and sherman was that they had heard rumors of the intention of the president to assign general j a mcclernand of illinois to take command of the expedition against vicksburg and they wished to forestall any such action but no notice of any such assignment had been as yet sent to grant and he had in fact the authority of halleck communicated in a dispatch of the ninth to appoint sherman to the command but on the eighteenth of the month while the transports were arriving to convey sherman and his troops down the river a dispatch came from washington saying it is the wish of the president that general mcclernand's corps shall constitute a part of the river expedition and that he shall have the immediate command under your direction this was a bitter order for general grant who thoroughly disliked and distrusted mcclernand but he did his best to obey it he immediately telegraphed to mcclernand who was at springfield illinois that he was to command one of the four corps into which the troops of the department had been divided and that his corps was to form part of the expedition to vicksburg he also repeated the unwelcome news by telegraph to sherman at memphis but neither of these dispatches reached its destination on account of an event which took place at this time and entirely changed the face of the campaign the fears which general grant entertained within a few days after the beginning of the expedition that his line of communication was too long to be safely held received a remarkable confirmation a large force of the enemy's cavalry under general forrest in the middle of december struck grant's lines of communication with the north and with the greater part of his own command and a simultaneous movement of much greater importance was made by general van dorn with thirty five hundred cavalry who passed by the left flank of grant and attacked his base of supplies at holly springs capturing the garrison on the twentieth and destroying a great quantity of valuable stores colonel murphy the same incapable officer who had abandoned iuka to price in so discreditable a manner had been carelessly left in command of this important point he had been warned of the coming danger but paid no attention to it and gave up the post without striking a blow upon hearing of this disaster to his line of supply grant did not hesitate a moment in regard to the course to be pursued he at once fell back north of the tallahatchie and telegraphed to halleck for permission to join the mississippi expedition this was promptly accorded and he hurried with his troops as rapidly as possible to memphis had this misadventure happened to grant at a later period of his career he would have paid no attention to it but gathering his troops compactly together would have at once advanced upon the enemy in front of him and in all probability would have beaten pemberton's army and taken vicksburg six months earlier than it was actually done but the experiment of living upon the enemy's country had not yet been tried the roads were bad the rainy season was beginning and he concluded the more prudent course was to return he learned something on the way back in regard to the problem of subsisting upon the enemy's country for some ten days he had no communication with the north and for a fortnight no supplies but the diligent system of foraging by which his army was fed on the route from coffeeville to grand junction served as a lesson to him which was afterwards put to splendid use by sherman and himself general grant arrived at holly springs on the twenty third of december where he remained a fortnight leaving a part of mcpherson's command on the tallahatchie while most of his troops were engaged in reopening and guarding the railroad from memphis to corinth the dispatch of general grant 
ordering mcclernand to take charge of the expedition from memphis as we have said miscarried the wires having been cut by forest troopers but the letter containing the same orders reached mcclernand at springfield and he immediately started for his post sherman in the meantime not knowing that he had been superseded in command started down the river on the twentieth of december ignorant also of the cavalry raids of forrest and van dorn which had put an end to grant's advance upon the interior of mississippi he started with thirty thousand men and taking on twelve thousand more at helena he steamed down the river and reached milliken's bend twenty miles above vicksburg on the morning of the twenty fifth here he landed a j smith's division to break up the shreveport railroad which supplied vicksburg with provisions from the west the other three divisions went on to the mouth of the yazoo river and moving up that stream some twelve miles they disembarked on the swampy bottoms at the foot of walnut hills where they were joined by smith's division a day later both grant and sherman had counted upon a surprise in this movement but in the nature of the case no surprise was possible the events of the autumn had attracted to this region the most anxious attention of the confederate government after van dorn's defeat at corinth jefferson davis had sent general pemberton an officer to whom he was personally much attached to take command of that department and not satisfied with this on the twenty fourth of november he assigned general j e johnston who was as yet only imperfectly recovered from the wounds which had disabled him at the battle of fair oaks to the supreme command of the armies commanded by pemberton in mississippi by e kirby smith in louisiana and by bragg in tennessee pemberton had a force outside of the garrisons at vicksburg and port hudson of twenty three thousand on the tallahatchie in arkansas lieutenant general holmes had a large army amounting according to general johnston to fifty five thousand men the new commander of the western armies immediately recommended that he be allowed to unite these forces for the purpose of attacking and overwhelming grant this suggestion was not adopted on arriving at chattanooga on the fourth of december he was informed of the danger with which pemberton was threatened by grant's advance that holmes had been ordered to reinforce him but fearing that holmes might be too late mr davis urged upon johnson the importance of sending to pemberton a large reinforcement from bragg's command he did not think it judicious to weaken bragg's army by this detachment but both generals set to work at once to organize the cavalry raids which were afterwards so effective mr davis's anxiety on account of affairs in mississippi the state of his residence was so great that he went to chattanooga in person to look into the situation of affairs in the threatened region he did not agree with general johnston in regard to the detachment of troops from bragg and ordered him to transfer nine thousand infantry and artillery from tennessee to pemberton he then set off for jackson the capital of mississippi accompanied by general johnston governor john j pettus had convened the legislature for the purpose of bringing the entire arms-bearing population of the state into the service to add to the inadequate force by which pemberton was endeavoring to defend the mississippi river on the twentieth at the moment when sherman was steaming away from memphis with his army the confederate president was inspecting and criticizing with that confidence in his own opinion which he regarded as justified by his west point education the extensive fortifications of vicksburg from that point johnston and jefferson davis went to the confederate camp near granada where pemberton was preparing to contest grant's expected passage of the yalabusha here the three confederate dignitaries had a conference in regard to the campaign which general johnston says revealed a wide divergence of views in regard to the mode of warfare best adapted to the circumstances a divergence which ultimately caused serious damage on the twenty seventh the retirement of grant towards the north and the destruction of the supplies at holly springs became known to pemberton and immediately afterwards the approach of the expedition against vicksburg was also announced to him the troops detached from bragg were sent to the defense of vicksburg mr davis after a fervent address to the legislature in which he urged the citizens of mississippi to 
go at once to vicksburg and assist in preserving the mississippi river that great artery of the country and thus conduce more than in any other way to the perpetuation of the confederacy and the success of the cause return to richmond when therefore general sherman landed his force upon the east bank of the yazoo the task which he had assigned himself had become already well-nigh impossible the bluffs in his front which he must cross a difficult bayou to reach were crowned by formidable earthworks and defended by an ample force for in the position which the confederates held one man for defense was as good as ten for attack in passable swamps on the left and the mississippi river on the right restricted the field of operations to a very narrow space and even that was of such a character that a description of it in the reports of the generals engaged at this lapse of time strikes the reader with amazement general frank p blair jr who led the principal attack on the enemy's works thus describes the ground he was compelled to traverse the enemy had improved their naturally strong position with consummate skill the bed of the bayou was perhaps one hundred yards in width covered with water for a distance of fifteen feet on the side of the bayou held by my troops after emerging from the heavy timber and descending a bank of eight or ten feet in height there was a growth of young cottonwoods thickly set which had been cut down by the enemy at the height of three or four feet and the tops of these saplings thrown down among these stumps so as to form a perfect net to entangle the feet of the assaulting party passing through this and coming to that part of the bayou containing water it was deep and miry and when this was crossed we encountered a steep bank on the side of the enemy at least ten feet high covered with a strong abatis and crowned with rifle pits from end to end above them was still another range of rifle pits and still above a circle of batteries of heavy guns which afforded a direct and enfilading fire upon every part of the plateau which rose gently from the first range of the rifle pits to the base of the embankment which formed the batteries yet it was not in the nature of a soldier like sherman even in the face of obstacles such as these to recoil without a battle and after two days of reconnaissances which would have discouraged any but the most daring fighter he ordered an assault over the ground we have seen described blair's brigade of frederick steele's division went in on the left and john f de courcy's brigade of g w morgan's division on the right over that tangled abatis through the clinging quicksands and the icy bayou up the perpendicular banks and over the plateau filled with death-dealing missiles blair leaving his horse floundering in the quicksands of the bayou led his brigade with desperate heroism piercing two successive lines of the confederate rifle pits and pausing only at the very foot of the enemy's earthworks there turning for the first time to look around he found that de courcy's brigade after handsomely crossing the bayou at a more favorable point had not been able to withstand the withering fire and that no support was forthcoming from any quarter the assault was over and blair had only to bring back what was left of his gallant brigade who retired in good order an attack had been made at the same time by the sixth missouri infantry who with heavy loss had crossed the bayou lower down but could not ascend the steep bank they scooped out with their hands caves in the perpendicular wall of sand to shelter them from the muskets of the enemy fired vertically over the parapet they were not extricated from this critical position till after nightfall and then one at a time blair's brigade out of about eighteen hundred men who marched into the action had lost six hundred and three in killed and wounded and missing de courcy's brigade even more seven hundred and twenty four the total casualties of sherman's force being seven hundred and seventy six our loss says general sherman had been pretty heavy and we had accomplished nothing and had inflicted little loss in our enemy his first intention was to renew the assault higher up the river on the next day a dense fog prevented the movement of the transports and the cooperation of the gunboats rain began to fall also and sherman observing the water marks upon the trees ten feet above ground concluded to abandon the attempt 
reinforcements to the enemy were constantly arriving he could hear the frequent whistle of the trains at vicksburg and could see battalions of men marching up towards haines bluff it was evident that no cooperation from grant in the interior was probable and he had had no communication with him since parting three weeks before he embarked his forces on the transports and steaming down the yazoo tied up again at milliken's bend where general mcclernand had already arrived to supersede him mcclernand took command of the army of the mississippi as he called it the next day dividing the forces into corps commanded respectively by morgan and sherman general mcclernand was for several years before the war a democratic congressman from the state of illinois he went early into the service and contributed a considerable personal and political influence to the support of the government at the outbreak of the rebellion it has been the habit of general grant's biographers to represent mcclernand as an intimate friend of president lincoln and as owing his original appointment and subsequent promotions to personal favoritism this impression however obtained is entirely incorrect it is true that general mcclernand was an acquaintance and fellow townsman of mr lincoln but they were never intimate friends their relations were those of lifelong political opponents but after the death of senator douglas there was probably no democrat in the state of illinois except john a logan who could bring such a decided and valuable support to the union cause as mcclernand and there was none who entered into the war with more of zeal and loyalty he and logan were both men of great courage ambition and capacity both successful lawyers and politicians the great difference between them which was developed later was that in addition to the ability influence and energy which they both possessed in something like an equal degree logan exhibited every day a constantly increasing aptitude for military command and the highest soldierly qualities not only of courage and intelligence but of strict obedience and subordination which latter mcclernand did not possess and seemed incapable of acquiring but these deficiencies of character had not become apparent in the autumn of eighteen sixty two and when in the month of october he came to washington and laid before the president a plan he had conceived of extensive recruiting service in illinois and other western states with a view of a campaign which was to liberate the mississippi valley the president and the secretary of war readily gave their consent with an understanding that he was to have such a command of the troops which were to be raised in great part by his own personal exertions as should be suitable to his services and rank the general plan was to give him command of a corps of troops taken from these proposed levies and an opportunity to take part in the coming campaign for the opening of the mississippi river in pursuance of this understanding general grant was ordered on the eighteenth of december to put general mcclernand in command of a corps grant promptly obeyed the order and as we have seen his telegram to mcclernand was delayed by forrest's raid sherman got away from memphis not knowing of his supersession had attacked at chickasaw bluffs and had been repulsed before the new commander arrived while lying at milliken's bend the question at once arose what was to be done with the troops sherman was anxious to do something to redeem the ill success that had thus far attended the expedition and mcclernand was naturally burning to illustrate his new command by some striking feat of arms they had both had their attention directed to the post of the enemy on the arkansas river some forty miles above its mouth called by the confederates fort hindman and by the union troops arkansas point general sherman says in his memoirs that on the very day mcclernand assumed command he asked of him leave to go up the arkansas and clear out the post mcclernand suggested a consultation with admiral porter which ended somewhat to general sherman's surprise in mcclernand's taking personal charge of the expedition instead of sending him and in porter's leading his flotilla in person instead of sending a subordinate the expedition once resolved upon was carried through with the greatest dispatch the army and the fleet under their respective energetic commanders made short work of the matter they reached the mouth of white river on the eighth of january and after prompt reconnaissances assaulted fort hinman by land and by water on the eleventh of january 
the works consisted of a four bastion fort commanding a bend of the river and a long line of entrenchments running from the river to an impassable bayou it was defended by about five thousand men sherman commanded the right and morgan the left of the union army while porter in person directed the vigorous and effective attack of the fleet after a sharp skirmish during which sherman got within a few hundred yards of the entrenchments the white flag was displayed and sherman and morgan at the two ends of the line rode into the enemy's works an instance of confusion ensued which might have led to awkward consequences as general thomas j churchill commanding the place asserted that he had not authorized the display of the white flag and one of his subordinates on the left of the rebel lines refused at first to surrender but seeing the hopelessness of further resistance churchill ordered his troops to stack their arms and the easy and valuable victory was complete the union loss was slight compared with the magnitude of the result accomplished the expedition remained three days to complete the destruction of the rebel works and then under grant's orders returned to napoleon at the mouth of the arkansas river on the seventeenth mcclernand had for a moment the intention to push his conquest further into arkansas but while planning this movement his justifiable complacency over his victory was rudely dashed by a dispatch from grant written upon receiving the first announcement of the expedition and in ignorance of its triumphant result in which he peremptorily ordered mcclernand to return to the mississippi at the same time telegraphing halleck that mcclernand had gone on a wild goose chase to the post of arkansas to which dispatch halleck replied with that unfailing confidence and support with which the government favored every movement and every request of grant you are hereby authorized to relieve general mcclernand from command of the expedition against vicksburg giving it to the next of rank or taking it yourself even after grant received the news of mcclernand's complete success his dislike and distrust of that general made it impossible for him to regard his conduct with approval or satisfaction general badeau says lacking any confidence in mcclernand's military judgment and supposing that the plan emanated solely from that officer he did not give it the same consideration it would have received had he known that sherman first suggested the idea the relations between the two generals were such that it was only a question of time when one of them must leave the service mcclernand answered grant's dispatch in an angry letter contrasting his own success with grant's failure in mississippi and the correspondence between them which opened in this inauspicious way continued in the same tone until six months later mcclernand was relieved of his command although it cannot be denied that it is not as a rule judicious to assign to a general in the field a subordinate who is distasteful to him we cannot but think that too much has been made of this want of harmony between mcclernand and grant so far as results are concerned the order appointing mcclernand to the command of the vicksburg expedition was not carried into effect until after sherman had made his attack and failed and during the few days when mcclernand exercised his independent command it was attended with the most brilliant possible success it is useless to discuss the point whether he or his more famous subordinate deserved the credit of the victory of arkansas post the practical fact is that mcclernand at least did not prevent it it was within the undoubted prerogative of the president and the secretary of war to give command of an army corps to a general who largely by his own personal exertions had raised it and placed it in the field and there has been more than enough talk among professional military writers about civilian interference in appointments to high command this interference is not only authorized but commanded by the constitution of the united states which places these appointments in the hands of the civil government and in a war carried on by thirty millions of free people the president who would entirely disregard popular or as some prefer to call it political influences would by that fact show himself incapable of understanding or properly executing the duties of his office mcclernand was not the only soldier in the western army who owed his appointment to such consideration 
grant and sherman themselves were constantly favored and protected by some of the most powerful statesmen in congress mcclernand's fault was not that he had been a politician but that he did not become a good soldier while blair and logan who in civil life were more popular and more distinguished politicians than mcclernand as soon as they put on army uniform surpassed him equally in their thorough obedience and subordination as generals general grant himself bore willing witness to the worth of logan and blair as soldiers if mcclernand had been supported at washington in his attitude of insubordination to his general the results would of course have been as disastrous as such a course would have been ill-advised but there never was the slightest disposition on the part of the president or the secretary of war to encourage him in such a course grant was made from beginning to end the absolute arbiter in all matters affecting the administration of his army in the order of the eighteenth of december assigning mcclernand to command it was expressly stated that he was to be under the direction of grant and afterwards at the first intimation of grant's dissatisfaction with his subordinate who had as yet it must be said done nothing to deserve it the government authorized him to relieve mcclernand from command leaving it optional with grant to give it to sherman or to take it himself and this attitude the government maintained until the last at the beginning of the final campaign against vicksburg the secretary of war telegraphed general grant has full and absolute authority to enforce his own commands and to remove any person who by ignorance inaction or any cause interferes with or delays his operations he has the full confidence of the government is expected to enforce his authority and will be firmly and heartily supported but he will be responsible for any failure to exert his powers you may communicate this to him end of chapter five Chapter Six of Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Seven. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abraham Lincoln: A History, Volume Seven, by John Hay and John George Nicolay. Chapter Six: The Campaign of the Bayous the most important result of the lack of harmony between grant and mcclernand was that the former not wishing to use the authority given him to relieve mcclernand of the command of the expedition against vicksburg in favor of sherman his junior determined to take personal charge of it himself a determination to which we owe one of the most brilliant and instructive chapters in all our annals in accordance with orders from the war department the army was divided into four corps numbered and commanded as follows the thirteenth by mcclernand the fifteenth by sherman the sixteenth by hurlbut and the seventeenth by mcpherson general grant lost no time in thoroughly completing this organization of his forces but in striking contrast to the conduct of some of our generals in the east he did not spend an hour in mere drill and discipline rightly believing that with an army composed like that of the tennessee the active work of a campaign was the best possible school hurlbut's corps was left in charge of the line of the memphis and charleston railroad and mcpherson's was as rapidly as possible brought down the river to join those of mcclernand and sherman already at milliken's bend general grant now found himself at the head of an army which upon any ordinary field would have been irresistible to any force the enemy were able to bring against him and the fact that for three months he was unable to make a single inch of progress only shows what powerful auxiliaries the army of pemberton possessed in the forces of nature and the singular topography of the country in which this extraordinary campaign was carried on vicksburg planted upon a plateau two hundred feet high surrounded by formidable outlying works and batteries defended from approach on the south by fortifications as far as warrenton and two hundred miles further down the river by the fortress of port hudson impregnable thus far to any force that could be brought against it from new orleans was still more strongly defended on the north 
by that vast network of bayou and marsh which filled the entire space from vicksburg to memphis north and south and from the yazoo to the mississippi east and west the sanguinary experiment of the chickasaw bluffs was enough to convince general grant of the impossibility of success by direct attack on the enemy's works anywhere between haines bluff and warrenton there was no soldier in the army upon whose judgment he relied so thoroughly as upon sherman's and certainly no subordinate commander could have rushed upon the enemy's works with more valor than that shown by frank blair on the twenty ninth of december he therefore had no disposition to repeat that experiment he says in his report from the moment of taking command in person i became satisfied that vicksburg could only be turned from the south side and for the purpose of accomplishing a movement in that direction his first plan was to take up and carry out with the utmost industry and energy the excavation of the canal which had been begun by general williams across the tongue of land on the louisiana side lying in a loop of the river commanded by vicksburg the highest hopes were built upon this work shared not only by the successive generals who undertook it and by admiral porter as well but upon their report by president lincoln and the authorities at washington after setting mcclernand's and sherman's troops at work upon the canal grant went to memphis where he spent a week making his final preparations for the campaign and then returned to vicksburg and on the thirtieth of january assumed personal command of the army general mcclernand who had looked forward to great usefulness and great fame in this capacity made a vociferous protest against the action of grant but the latter secure in his position simply forwarded the protest to washington where it received no further notice as soon as grant began a thorough inspection of his troops and of the canal upon which they were engaged he lost much of the faith with which he and others had hitherto regarded the enterprise the current of the river was almost at right angles to the trench and its lower end was easily commanded by the bluffs on the mississippi side nevertheless he was not inclined to drop the work without giving it a thorough trial and the exhausting and unwholesome toil of the soldiers lasted for nearly two months longer but on the eighth of march when the excavation was almost completed a sudden rise of the river broke down the northern dyke which guarded the canal and flooded not only the enormous ditch but the entire peninsula as well destroying to a great extent the lateral dike which protected it and driving the troops to the levee to save their lives when this flood subsided the canal was found to be a ditch full of stagnant water and nothing more the current refused to seek the channel provided for it with so much labor and pains a fortnight more of severe work with dredging machines was wasted upon it when the batteries from the warrenton bluffs got the range of the working parties and the work was at last abandoned a confessed failure but while it was going on grant having a large surplus of men who could not find standing room on the narrow peninsula of young's point devoted great labor and care to three other enterprises of a similar nature by which he hoped to derive some advantage from the singular natural features of the country which had hitherto been only profitable to his adversary on the west side of the mississippi the network of lakes and bayous which on the east were compressed within the limits of the yazoo bluffs and the mississippi river stretched out into almost illimitable extent westward over the greater part of the state of louisiana and southward to the gulf of mexico general grant hoped by availing himself of one of the more important of the bayous on this side called lake providence to open a passage through the tensas and the washita to the mouth of the red river nearly two hundred miles below and in that way to effect a communication with the army under general banks and the navy under farragut the greater part of the way such a route was entirely practicable but from lake providence to bayou macon about six miles distance the only thoroughfare was bayou baxter which was partly stream and partly cypress swamp to open this route it was necessary to secure a channel through the swamp dig up the stumps of trees with which it was filled and pierce a hole in the mississippi river levee opposite lake providence this work was assigned to mcpherson's corps and prosecuted with vigor until the middle of march 
it proved as usual to be far more difficult than the most accomplished engineers had imagined the men worked a great part of the time up to their shoulders in water and the task of clearing the channel of cypress stumps was exasperatingly slow the levee was pierced on the seventeenth of march and shortly afterwards mcpherson reported that with a few days more work cutting stumps and dredging the shallows the canal might be made practicable for light draft boats by this time however general grant had formed a new plan and all the labor expended on the lake providence route went for naught another scheme was to open communication from the mississippi to the cold water by means of a bayou called the yazoo pass which in former years was the ordinary means of transit from memphis to yazoo city but as the lands in this region are lower than the surface of the river at high water an unusually heavy levee had been built directly across the pass for the purpose of reclaiming the rich bottoms it was resolved at the end of january to cut this levee and try to re-establish communication by water between the mississippi the cold water the tallahatchie and yazoo rivers by this route general grant only expected at first to enter the yazoo and destroy the enemy's transports in that stream and some gunboats which it was thought were building there the levee was cut on the third of february by colonel j h wilson of the engineers and in a few hours the opening was forty yards wide and the water pouring through says colonel wilson like nothing else i ever saw except niagara falls logs trees and great masses of earth were torn away with the greatest ease as soon as the rush of water settled several boats steamed into the pass and the navigation was found so much better than it had been expected that general grant indulged for a time the hope of making this the route for obtaining a foothold on high land above haines bluff a considerable expedition was therefore sent through the pass which succeeded in reaching the cold water on the second of march after much difficulty and the partial disabling of most of the boats but from that point to fort pemberton a confederate fortification extending from the tallahatchie to the yazoo near their junction at greenwood the expedition found no special obstacles to navigation nor any considerable interruption from the enemy but the land around the fort being low and mostly overflowed it was impossible to effect a landing and the works were too strong for the gunboats the expedition was therefore given up and the troops withdrawn in the latter part of march equally futile with the rest so far as results were concerned but the most interesting of all in its personal incidents was the attempt to turn the works at haines bluff a point on the yazoo about fifteen miles above vicksburg by way of steele's bayou while the expedition just mentioned was still in front of the enemy at fort pemberton admiral porter made a reconnaissance up steele's bayou towards deer creek and gave so favorable a report of the navigability of those streams that grant imagined it might be possible to get through by that route to the sunflower river and thence to the yazoo which would bring a union force on the rear of fort pemberton and not only ensure its capture but also give an invaluable advantage of position in the campaign against vicksburg he accompanied the admiral on a second trip through steele's bayou and seeing no serious obstacles to navigation except overhanging trees he pushed back to young's point and dispatched sherman with a division to join porter on this promising mission sherman going ahead of his troops found the admiral in aggressive spirits and confident of reaching the sunflower but as he was returning to bring up his forces he received a message from porter saying that he had unexpectedly come upon a force of the enemy who were giving him great annoyance and asking him to come immediately to his assistance sherman took a canoe and paddled down the bayou till he met a navy tug and the transport silver wave loaded with troops with these he started back at the utmost speed crashing through the trees carrying away pilot-house smokestacks and everything above deck it was pitch dark and after making two miles and a half they were brought to a stop they then disembarked and marched in through the cane brake carrying lighted candles in their hands till they came to some open fields where they lay down for a nap they were up and off again at daylight 
the soldiers could not complain of the forced march when they saw general sherman trotting on foot at the double quick at their head they made twenty-one miles by noon their speed says general sherman was accelerated by the sounds of the navy guns which became more and more distinct as the relieving forces pushed on to the rescue through brake and bayou sometimes in water waist-deep at last they struck a small body of confederates who were felling trees along the stream in porter's rear and drove them away here sherman mounted a bare-backed horse and once more a cavalier rode to the front and across a cotton field to where the beleaguered admiral lay in the miry bayou he was on the deck of one of his ironclads standing full armored inside of a section of a smokestack which served as a shield against the rebel sharpshooters the rebels had obstructed the channel of deer creek so that no further progress in that direction was possible and the opportune arrival of sherman had prevented their doing the same thing in the rear and had thus saved the fleet from capture or destruction it took three days for the boats to back out of the creek which was too narrow to admit of their turning but the expeditions at last on the twenty seventh arrived at young's point without loss as soon as general grant heard that the deer creek expedition had failed and that admiral porter had started on his return he ordered the recall of the yazoo pass expedition from fort greenwood and immediately after his resolute fashion put both enterprises in mercantile phrase to the account of profit and loss the work was not entirely without its value it carried our troops said general grant into the heart of the granary from which the vicksburg forces are now being fed it caused great alarm among the enemy and led them to move a number of their guns from batteries on the river much cotton was burnt and some was brought away a great quantity of beef bacon poultry and corn was consumed or destroyed and a large number of cattle seized and several hundred negroes returned with the troops but after all it must be said that the most important result of the expedition was that it finished the series of groping and tentative enterprises which during three months had occupied the western army all avenues of approach towards vicksburg had one by one been tested and the successive failure of all of them drove general grant in a manner which he calls providential to the line of operations in which an immense success awaited him he now determined to move his army partly by land and partly by water to a point below vicksburg on the mississippi to join hands with general banks and effect the reduction of port hudson and then with the united armies and fleets to move upon vicksburg and pemberton's army the same cause which had operated at last to destroy the efficiency of his canals had begun to make the roads practicable the rainy season was ending the floods of the early spring were subsiding and although the roads would still have to have been counted execrable by those accustomed to the turnpikes of civilization they had become as good as they generally are in that land of perpetual mud this was the dark hour of general grant's fortunes the battle of shiloh had not increased the fame which he won at donelson the credit of partial successes at iuka and corinth had gone exclusively to rosencrans the unsuccessful march upon granada and the disastrous assault at chickasaw bluffs had each contributed its part to cloud his reputation and the apparently futile gropings about the canals and bayous had done nothing to satisfy the intense and eager expectations with which the public mind had for months been directed towards his army and now just upon the eve of his greatest exploits distrust and suspicion became general throughout the country and found a voice even in quarters nearest the president on the fourth of april the secretary of the treasury sent to mr lincoln a letter from one of the ablest and most loyal of the western journalists attacking general grant in the bitterest language accusing him not only of utter incapacity but of flagrant misconduct and demanding in the name of the western people and the western troops that his command should be taken from him and given to rosencrans mr chase added to this letter his own strong endorsement saying reports concerning general grant similar to the statement made by mr 
name withheld are too common to be safely or even prudently disregarded and three weeks later the secretary being in philadelphia felt compelled by his disbelief in general grant to write suggesting his supersession unless something decisive he says is to be done on the mississippi shore is it not clear that grant's army should be made to cooperate otherwise with rosecrans how i wish that sherman was at the head of that army instead of grant he is certainly an abler and better and more reliable commander yet in spite of this and many similar attempts to destroy his confidence in the quiet western general the president stood stoutly by him saying he should have his chance and answering the overzealous people who accused grant of intemperance by the famous mo if i knew what brand of whiskey he drinks i would send a barrel or so to some of the other generals there were but three courses open to general grant at this juncture one was to assault the enemy's works in front from which his reason and conscience both revolted another to return up the mississippi to memphis and from grand junction to move southward on the line of the mississippi central renewing the unsuccessful campaign of december with the added strength and experience which he and his troops had gained in the meantime there was much to be said in favor of this plan and it was the one urged upon him by one of the ablest generals in the army on the eighth of april general sherman after discussing the matter verbally with general grant wrote him a letter advising the seizure and fortification of the yazoo pass the cold water and tallahatchie rivers the securing and reopening of the road back to memphis and as soon as the water should subside an attack upon granada then to attack the land of the yalabusha as a base from which to operate against the points where the mississippi central and the vicksburg and jackson railroads cross the big black he thought that this should ensure the capture of vicksburg it is the opinion of many intelligent soldiers that this plan offered better chances of success than the one which was actually adopted and it is known that general grant himself was of the opinion that by cutting loose from his base at the time of the forest and van dorn raids he might have brought his army successfully in the rear of vicksburg but neither the persuasion of his nearest friend and favorite general nor the evident difficulties and dangers of the plan he had chosen were sufficient to change the mind of general grant when once determined upon the movement to the south he was never in the habit of discussing his campaigns or giving many reasons for his actions but it is altogether probable that what are contemptuously called by military writers political considerations which grant was far too wise a man to disregard had much to do with his final choice to leave vicksburg and transport his army to memphis would have presented to both sides the appearance of a retreat which could not have been explained without also informing the enemy of general grant's intention and purpose and in that time of gloom and stagnation in the period between fredericksburg and chancellorville a retrograde movement on so great a scale on the part of the western army would have had a most unfavorable effect on the public mind of the north and would have been regarded as a reason for profound encouragement and congratulation on the part of the chiefs of the rebellion and their anxious sympathizers in europe grant selected as the first point below vicksburg which could be reached by land at the stage of water then existing the village of new carthage and directed the thirteenth corps under general mcclernand to start for that point on the twenty ninth of march the fifteenth and seventeenth corps were to follow the movement was slow and laborious on account of the wretched condition of the roads and when mcclernand arrived in the vicinity of new carthage it was found that the levee of bayou vidal was broken in several places and new carthage was surrounded by water a change of route was thus made necessary they marched around bayou vidal to perkins plantation which made a journey of thirty-five miles from millikan's bend to water communication while this march was going on the attention of the enemy was distracted by sending steele's division up the river to greenville one hundred and fifty miles where it landed and raided the country in the neighborhood of the rolling fork 
and created the impression on pemberton's mind that another attack was imminent from that direction meanwhile admiral porter was preparing for the long contemplated and perilous enterprise of running past the batteries of vicksburg and warrenton there was strictly speaking no novelty in this attempt for during the previous two months the practicability of the enterprise had been demonstrated more than once the ram queen of the west under the gallant colonel charles r ellet had run by the batteries in open day on the morning of the second of february and had then dashed up the mouth of the red river and captured several confederate transports ten days afterwards the gunboat indianola had run the same gauntlet by night though both boats were afterwards attacked and captured by the confederates on the fourteenth of march farragut with his flagship the hartford and the albatross had passed the batteries at port hudson the rest of his fleet failing to get by as these two vessels were not strong enough to maintain the blockade of the red river general a w ellet of the same family of amphibious fighters as the officer above mentioned sent down two rams to join farragut the lancaster and the switzerland the former was destroyed and the latter much disabled but to a sailor of porter's temperament these partly successful ventures simply proved that the thing could be done and he assured general grant without hesitation that he could take his fleet past the batteries at any moment it was required with the understanding that they would probably not be able to repass them and on the sixteenth of april when grant announced his readiness for the movement porter was equally prepared for his part of the dangerous enterprise at ten o'clock on the night of the sixteenth of april admiral porter with seven ironclads three river steamers and ten barges swung into the stream and floated down the river there was no moon the fires were banked no lights were displayed and in the silence and darkness the fleet glided through the shadows and was not discovered until fairly abreast of the town all at once at the first shots from one of the batteries a terrific cannonade burst from the terraced heights of vicksburg lighting up the river with continuous flashings and awaking thunderous echoes over many miles of river bluff and bayou heaps of combustibles prepared for the purpose were fired and the torch was applied to houses along the river bank which shed a light almost as bright as day upon a scene of terrible beauty porter's fleet responded instantly to the attack of the forts and his gunboats poured one by one their broadsides into the town as they passed he steamed boldly in under the blazing bluffs while the transports gliding as near as they could to the louisiana shore sought to escape under cover of the smoke and tumult into the darkness beyond the town the transports passed the public place opposite the courthouse a little after midnight and were here exposed to a most furious fire the batteries guided by a light like that of a lurid midday converged their fire upon the passing vessels and the roar of artillery from the bluffs was answered by the clear ring of the navy guns from the river the barges were cut loose and floated down the stream to their destination at new carthage while the naval vessels lingered behind to cover the rear of the flotilla in spite of the heavy fire to which they were subjected there was comparatively little damage done though every transport was struck only one was destroyed the henry clay was set on fire by the explosion of a shell and the flames from her upper works darting aloft into the clear darkness of the night added to the strange impressiveness of the scene she cast loose the barge which she was towing but this also was soon discovered to be on fire and general sherman who was watching the bombardment in a small boat picked up the pilot as he floated from the wreck the crew scrambled ashore and hid behind the levee till the firing was over and then made their way through the flooded bottoms to their camps the whole population of vicksburg had been drawn from their beds by the light and the noise and watched with a deep interest from the wide circle of hills the blaze and tumult of this extraordinary battle it lasted two hours and a half but at last the barges had floated southward into the sheltering darkness the blazing wreck had burned down to the water's edge 
the gunboats sending their useless parthian shots defiantly backwards had steamed out of range the tuscumbia herded the last stragglers bringing up the rear and the silence only deeper for this midnight disturbance of fire and fury again enveloped vicksburg in its girdle of forts when the barges first came floating down the stream and the burning wreck of the henry clay was seen the rebels on the plantation below imagined that the yankee fleet had been destroyed and even at mcclernand's headquarters the officers were not without fear of such a disaster but one by one the transports the barges and at last the exultant naval vessels gathered in and it was found that the peril of the passage had been more apparent than real no one was killed on the gunboats eight only were wounded and all of admiral porter's vessels were ready for service within half an hour after passing the batteries the success was so perfect that a few days later grant sent another fleet of six vessels past the batteries with the loss of only one their crews with two exceptions declined the dangerous service but a call for volunteers produced from the hardy soldiers of illinois and missouri men enough to have manned a hundred vessels grant having thus accumulated a sufficient number of transports to effect his crossing of the river rapidly transferred mcclernand's force from perkins plantation to a village called hard times a short distance above the gulf-like bend of the river upon which the confederate fort at grand gulf was situated two divisions of mcpherson's corps headed by general logan marched close behind them and on the twenty ninth of april everything was ready for the movement upon grand gulf sherman was left behind at milliken's bend there were so few roads and they were in such bad condition that it was a slow business for one corps to wait till the one in advance had cleared the route sherman while waiting for his orders to march received a letter from general grant announcing his purpose to cross over and attack the grand gulf and suggesting that he could usefully employ this time of waiting by making a demonstration upon haines bluff it was a suggestion grant made with reluctance as he feared the feint might be taken for a genuine attack and repulse and subject general sherman to misconstruction and criticism in the north it is true that general sherman was not more fond of calumnious attack than others but where he saw an opportunity of making himself useful he was ready to take the chances of criticism as well as of bullets so without a moment's hesitation he replied that he would make the feint required and set about it in a bustling and boisterous manner with a great movement of camps and a blowing of whistles and the moving up and down of all the transports he could get afloat he took however only ten of the smallest regiments he could find to make a show of force in this way he proceeded with as much noise and ostentation as was possible in the direction of haines bluff the demonstration was perfectly successful as it distracted the attention of pemberton and drew away a considerable portion of his troops at a most critical time a still more serious distraction and damage was that spread through the whole interior of the state of mississippi from grand junction to baton rouge by the cavalry of general b h grierson this expedition one of the most important of the kind during the war was organized at lagrange in the middle of april by general hurlbut in pursuance of general grant's orders its mission was to ride through the state of mississippi to some safe point on the river below vicksburg to destroy the railroads on its course to cut off supplies and in short to do all the damage possible to the confederate cause and as little as possible to peaceable people general grant hoped that this expedition might test the idea he entertained that the pressure of war had forced to the border all the available forces of the confederacy and that the interior would be found to be a hollow shell the expedition of grierson went far to confirm this impression he started on the seventeenth of april with seventeen hundred men but soon detached one regiment under colonel edward hatch to destroy the railroad between columbus and macon and return north he was not wholly successful but made an efficient diversion of some of the enemy's force grierson rode rapidly down to the vicksburg and meridian railroad 
tearing up several miles of the track near meridian moving then to the southwest he broke up the railroad between jackson and new orleans still riding southward he beat a detachment of cavalry sent out to intercept him from grand gulf and leaving port hudson on his right he rode into the union camp at baton rouge on the second of may he had traversed the state of mississippi six hundred miles in sixteen days he had captured five hundred prisoners he had destroyed over fifty miles of railroad and telegraph and a vast amount of military stores he had burned several factories producing supplies for the confederate army broken up several locomotives and unnumbered bridges he had spread terror and dismay through a vast extent of country and from one end to the other of the state he had thrown confusion and disorder into the confederate councils at the very moment of all others when concentration against their formidable enemy on the mississippi was a vital necessity to the confederacy in the west scarcely less remarkable than the gallantry and swiftness of his march was the generosity and kindness with which grierson treated the people of the district through which he rode on approaching a town he would send a battalion in advance to establish pickets protect property maintain order and quiet the fears of the inhabitants at some points where he found the citizens in arms for the defense of their homes even after they had fired upon his troops and had been captured he would kindly represent to them the folly of their acts and release them this magnanimity had the happiest of effects in some cases the citizens grateful for this unexpected kindness volunteered valuable information and even offered to serve as guides grant was now ready after all these months of experiment and preparation to throw his forces in a compact mass against the enemy his action at this point has been fancifully compared to that of the wild bee in the western woods who rising to the clear air flies for a moment in a circle and then darts with the speed of a rifle bullet to his destination if pemberton had been ready to meet him with the same energy and order the issue of the contest might have been very different for there was no great disparity of troops between them pemberton's report of the thirty first of march showed an aggregate of eighty two thousand three hundred and eighteen of whom sixty one thousand four hundred and ninety five were present and forty eight thousand eight hundred and twenty nine fit for duty they were all within reasonable distance of each other so that they might have been readily concentrated general c l stevenson had twenty two thousand effectives holding the vicksburg line from haines bluff to grand gulf general franklin gardner had over sixteen thousand at port hudson while w w loring in the neighborhood of granada and fort pemberton had an army of seven thousand there were from five thousand to ten thousand others scattered in small garrisons about the state the greater portion of them watching hurlbut in the north they had the great advantage over grant of high and dry roads and ready communication by rail and telegraph but they did not make use of their advantage it is true that grand gulf the point immediately threatened by grant had been garrisoned early in march by a brigade under general john s bowen who had detached three of his regiments to the right bank of the river to watch mcclernand's advance but the mind of general pemberton had been so long fixed upon the idea of an attack upon his right flank that he was slow to credit the rumors of an advance in force upon his left many things conspired to trouble and mislead him on this point the successive demonstrations into deer creek and sunflower the bewildering raid of grierson and finally the most important of all the sailing of ellet's marine brigade up the river under orders to the tennessee were circumstances that altogether afforded some justification for his unfortunate incredulity in which it must be said the commander-in-chief of the district general j e johnston shared under the impression that grant was preparing for another move southward from the direction of memphis a considerable portion of pemberton's command was ordered to the tennessee line and it was only after the passage of the fleet that pemberton and johnston began to realize the magnitude of the demonstration upon their left the troops on their way to tennessee were ordered back and bowen's detachment to the west of the river was hastily recalled 
just in time to escape capture even then pemberton's doubts had not deepened into certainty though on the twenty third of april from his headquarters at jackson he warned general stevenson at vicksburg that warrenton or grand gulf was threatened and that he must hold all his troops ready to be directed upon either of these points but a week after this sherman made his imposing feint at haines bluff and again threw doubt and perplexity into the mind of the confederate commander at this same moment he heard from general brown of the arrival of a heavy force at hard times and he hurriedly ordered a brigade from port hudson and directed stevenson to hold five thousand more troops in readiness to move to bowen's help whose force increased by that of general m e green amounted by this time to about five thousand but owing to the state of uncertainty existing in pemberton's mind as to which of these flanks was actually attacked this force from stevenson was not sent after all the delays and all the warnings grant arrived at grand gulf before he was expected and before adequate preparations had been made to receive him this quiet river hamlet was the terminus of a little railway running to port gibson it was strongly fortified and had a certain importance as commanding the mouth of the big black river porter attacked the works with his usual energy on the morning of the twenty ninth of april and continued a furious bombardment until afternoon under the eye of grant who watched the engagement from a tug in the stream he had loaded all the transports and barges in his reach within three divisions of mcclernand's corps intending to assault the enemy's works at the moment that porter should have silenced or materially disabled the confederate batteries but after five hours of a furious cannonade it became evident to both the admiral and the general that no impression could be made by the gunboats upon works so strong and so well defended and at such an elevation as those of grand gulf it was characteristic of grant that he did not at this juncture waste an hour in doubt or in new preparations after having become convinced that he could not take the batteries he immediately landed his troops at hard times and marched them across the narrow peninsula opposite grand gulf reaching dry ground on the mississippi three miles below at a plantation called de shroon's when night fell porter renewed his fire upon the forts and in the midst of the racket the transports and gunboats came down and joined the army almost without damage here after what would have seemed to some commanders a day of failure grant whose quiet courage and steadfast faith had taken the repulse at grand gulf as a mere incident of the day's work having no bearing on the ultimate success of his expedition absolutely sure after all his misadventures that he was now upon the right track sent this remarkable dispatch to washington the gunboats engaged grand gulf batteries from eight a m until one p m and from dusk until ten p m the army and transports are now below grand gulf a landing will be effected on the east bank of the river to-morrow i feel that the battle is now more than half won End of chapter six